Well, I think you're all very hardy and very brave coming to a 9.30 talk at night, <laughs> knowing how little sleep you're going to get. Maybe it's our version of the late night movies. <laughs> so, why Ashoka? He wasn't a teacher, he wasn't a monk, he was a householder, he was a ruler. Two very important reasons. One is that it was because of him that we could sit in this hall tonight and practice Dhamma. It was his foresight, because he lived at a time when Dhamma, when Panya was still strong in India, fairly soon after the Buddha, and he sent those two arahants, Sona and Uttara, to Burma, and they started that long chain of teachers through Lady Sayadaw, Sayatet, Ubakin, and Korsko Enkaji, right down to us. And that's how we could get it. So we're incredibly grateful to this ruler. But there's another reason also. He was as the slide says, an ideal ruler. His reign was something quite extraordinary in the known history of the world. A Dhamma ruler who practiced his Dhamma and applied it in his rule. He unified India. He founded probably what is the first welfare state ever. Despite his own strong Dhamma practice, he practiced complete religious tolerance. If only some of our other rulers could do that today. In his edicts, he probably used the first writing. He espoused, at the height of his power, he espoused non-violence, restraint towards all beings, and this extended even to animals in his kingdom. Really an extraordinary man, and it led to something like 30 golden years for India of uninterrupted prosperity with no hint of any war, no insurrection, no civil disturbance that we know of at all. But it didn't start like that. So let's have a look at a few approximate dates and get the history. Again, all these dates are approximate. They're scholars' best estimates, but generally agreed. It gives us a rough idea. So the Parinibbana of the Buddha, about 478, and these are all BCE, before Christian era. And 150 years or so later, Alexander the Great swept through, conquered even part of India, left his mark. And you'll see that just one year after that, we have Chandragupta, seizing the throne of the ancient kingdom of Magadha. You will have heard all about Magadha in the suttas, in Goenkaji's discourses. So this was the kingdom which Chandragupta seized. Chandragupta, it seems, also helped Alexander. And that is why he became a ruler of the northern area and from that seized the throne. He reigned for a long time. He was a powerful, successful monarch. And retired from the throne in 299, became a Jain monk, went off to South India and starved himself to death out of extremes. He was followed by his son, Bindusara. Bindusara's main claim seems to have been he had many wives and many children, of which Ashoka was one. Ashoka was not the oldest but he was a possible male heir. He was the son of the second queen of Bindusara. And his name comes from when he was born, his mother, one of Bindusara's wives, was so happy that she produced a male heir. She said, now I have no more sorrows. And that's what Ashoka means. Soka means sorrow. Ashoka, the king without sorrow. And in his early years, he was sent off to quell a rebellion up at Taxila by his father Bindusara. And then he became the viceroy of Ujjain, 
a town or city in central India. We'll see where it is later. And he seems to have had a nice time in Ujjain. He got a girlfriend. And the very first rock edict we have, his carving in rock, or rather a rough one, talks about him coming to this spot on a pleasure tour with his unwedded consort. So, very sweet. And this lady's name, his girlfriend's name, was Davy, and she bore him a son and a daughter. The son was called Mahinda, the daughter Sangamitta. Remember those names because they will feature later on. Both took robes and became an important part of Ashoka's spread of Dhamma. But sooner or later, duty called. Bindusara was dying. Ashoka was called back to the main capital of Pataliputra. And then you'll see, if you look at those dates, Bindusara died in 274. Ashoka was only crowned in 270. Four years of internecine warfare, wars of succession between all Bindusara's sons. And it's said that Ashoka killed them all. So he ascends to the throne. Only after four years is he confident enough to have a coronation. And now he's Chanda Ashoka. Ashoka the cruel. Chanda means wrathful, like a thundercloud. He committed many acts of cruelty. It's said that he even built a torture chamber in his capital so that his victims could experience the five kinds of hell on earth. This was the kind of man he was. Let's have a look at his empire. As you see, it was enormous. This was what he inherited. Chandragupta, his grandfather, had inherited India proper, but then was attacked by the local king, Seleucus, one of Alexander's successors, fought off Seleucus and in the process gained Pakistan and Afghanistan. Very wisely, Chandragupta had a treaty with Seleucus which kept the peace thereafter. He got the land and in return he sold or gave Seleucus 500 war elephants. I think Chandragupta got the better deal. So this is what Ashoka inherited. Now you'll see where his capital is. It's on the right, Pataliputra, and it's just above Bodhgaya. Over on the left, you'll see Ujjain, and below it, Sanchi, a very important archeological site, a lot of Ashokan monuments there, and a place close to his heart, because this is where Devi, his girlfriend, his first girlfriend retired, brought up Mahinda and Sangamitta, and she took robes, they all took robes. Up in the north, you'll see Taxila. Now, there's a big blue area, but there's, on the right, there's a white area, Kalinga. And Kalinga was independent, it was a republic. Bindusara, Ashoka's father, had tried to conquer it and failed. And after eight years, Ashoka decided that he would try and conquer it too. Now this is Chanda Ashoka, the cruel. Kalinga was a pretty feisty republic. They fielded an army of 60,000 infantry, a thousand elephants, which were the battle tanks of those days. It was a formidable army. Ashoka sent a bigger army against them with instructions to his commanders to show no mercy. None was shown. It was a massive battle, and we have the figures, 100,000 slain on the battlefield, 150,000 deported thereafter, and many more losing their lives for one reason or another. So upwards of a quarter of a million people's deaths were caused by this invasion, which Ashoka won, and he annexed Kalinga. And this seems to have been the turning point. There are different stories about how it happened. One story is that Ashoka, walking up and down the battlefield afterwards, 
listening to the groans of the wounded, the keening of the relatives, watching the bodies, apparently a woman came up to him, a Kalingan woman, and said, because of your actions, I've lost my father, I've lost my husband, I've lost my son, and now what will I do? Whether because of this or some other reason, he became struck with remorse and started genuinely changing. And then there followed this period when he became Dhamma Ashoka and when there was this wonderful 30-year period. After that, after he died, and we'll go more into that in a minute, he then became forgotten for something like almost 2,000 years. His monuments all smashed, broken, burnt, buried, any written records excised, removed. And it got to the point where people even thought, was Ashoka a real figure? Was he just a myth? He was that much forgotten. Now let's see how that happened. This is Sanchi, as I mentioned, an important site where he built many monuments. These are some of the ruins at Sanchi after his reign. When he died, his empire disintegrated very quickly. In 1193, so this is many years, centuries later, there was a Muslim invasion. A gentleman called Sultan Muhammad of Gore set up his capital at Lahore. He was coming out of the Middle East and he was on a jihad, a holy war, to spread Islam as far as he could. And his chosen Methods of spreading Islam were fire and the sword. And you'll see the quote below when he decided to invade India. This is by his biographer. Maybe there was a little bit of exaggeration, but probably not much. He purged by his sword the land of Hind from the filth of infidelity and the impurity of idol worship and left not one temple standing. In Delhi, it said he destroyed a thousand temples. And he kept going like that. He wasn't there personally. This was his general, a slave. And at this point, Delhi invaded, subjugated. Another slave, a commander called Mohammed Bakhtiar, was given permission to ride on with a few hundred horse to ride east and see what he could find. Mohammed Bhaktiya's main element, he was a good commander, was surprise. He arrived at Bihar. He took the fort of Bihar, a well-defended fort, before the defendants even realized they were under attack. And then he moved on and came to a large complex of buildings which he overlooked from a hill. This was the ancient University of Nalanda. A huge repository of Buddhist texts. At its height, it had had 7,000 monks studying there, three major libraries, all on three stories, also containing all the records of Ashoka's realm. Now, Muhammad Bhaktiya saw this. He didn't know what it was. And he had just one question. He said, do they have a copy of the Quran? And the answer was no. And he said, destroy it. And that's exactly what they did. They went in and killed every single monk there. They didn't even realize they were monks. They thought they were Hindus, but that didn't matter. Apparently one escaped, an old Tibetan man. All the rest were slaughtered. And then he came across these massive libraries. And he was very puzzled by these and asked what they were. But the historians relate that no one could tell him because everyone was dead. So he thought, well, I'll burn them. So he started burning all the manuscripts, the parchments, the records in this huge University of Nalanda. And it said that for months, the sky was dark in the overhanging hills with a dark pall of smoke from burning manuscripts. Later on, he completed his job he destroyed five major monasteries in Bihar and Bengal, 
and successfully destroyed all written records of Ashoka's realm for a thousand years. Now we move on 150 years to a different ruler now, a very different ruler. His name was Thiroz Shah. And he was a mild-mannered, curious man. He had to be persuaded to ascend the throne, the Mughal throne of Delhi. He didn't want to do it, but he accepted. And he was very open-minded, almost to the point of being heretical as far as Islam was concerned. He had a Hindu mother. And he liked to travel around his country. One time when he was traveling, he went to Meerut, a town a little bit off to the north of Delhi. And there he found an enormous pillar. No one could tell him what this pillar was. There was writing on it. There was some rumor that it had once belonged to a giant called Bim, who one, one of the Pandava brothers who walked the the earth at that time, no one really knew. But he was very taken with it. He thought it was really quite beautiful and he decided he would have it. Now he was building a kotla. A kotla is a fort and you can see the ruins of it below and to the right of it was a mosque. The original fort had been built by Muhammad of Gore's general who conquered Delhi and he'd planned to build a massive minaret over it to celebrate his victories over the infidels. But he died before the first or second story could be built. So Firaz Shah thought he'd complete the job. It was a big feat of engineering because this column weighed 50 tons. It was dug out, fell gently onto a bed of cotton wood prepared for it, covered with skins, taken on a cart with 42 wheels, pulled with ropes by thousands of men down to the Jumuna River, where it was lashed to barges and taken down to his fort. And there it is, sitting on top of his fort. It's still there today. And he was very proud of this, and he reckoned it was a, a great addition to his mosque and to his fort. Now today, if you go to Delhi, You'll still see the ruins, but the Firoz Shah Kotla has now been dedicated to a different god. If you ask any taxi driver to take you to the Firoz Shah Kotla, they'll take you to the 2020 cricket ground, which is just next door. <laughs> and there's the golden column with the writing. And Feroz Shah kept asking all the pandits, all the scholars, no one knew what it was. They thought it might be Greek, but they really weren't sure. And now we fast forward again to a new set of invaders in India. And these were the British. We're now down to the 19th century. The East India Company came, set up in India. And most of the British who came out were just interested in making as much money as they could, getting as many promotions as they could. This was either the East India Company or later the military, getting some place in society out there and getting home again before their health was wrecked by the Indian climate. So that was what most people wanted to do. But there were a few British who were curious, curious about the local culture, the local religions, and they started looking around and they started coming across rocks like this one with inscriptions on them. And you can see these inscriptions. They couldn't read them. They didn't know what they were, but they were curious and they made copies of them. And sooner or later, an Asiatic society was founded in Bengal, modelled on the Royal Society in Britain at that time by a gentleman, a polymath called Sir William Jones, who was actually a judge of the Bengal High Court fluent, I think, in 18 languages, including Arabic and Persian, and familiar with 36 more. He was very curious. He reckoned that Sanskrit, Greek, and Roman were came from the same original language. He was correct. 
but he could not yet decipher this writing. But what puzzled them was the extent of their findings. So this map here shows Ashokan pillars. There were seven pillars. There were seven major rock edicts and numerous minor rock edicts. And they were all over the place, right up the north at the bottom of the Himalayas, over to Kandahar in Afghanistan, down in South India, over towards Bangladesh, this huge area. Who was putting these inscriptions here, these inscriptions they couldn't read. They didn't know. They were very puzzled. And then around 1832, along comes this man, James Princep. He was a Scotsman, brought up in Scotland from a poor family. It's said that it was so poor that he and his brother had to share a pair of breeches when they were children. They both came out to India to make their fortunes. He was a very sharp young man. He was hired by the East India Company and he was put in charge of the mint at Varanasi, the mint which produced coins. And he produced some quite learned treatises on the smelting of metals and their performance under heat. And he also got interested in ancient coins and studied them as well. And he was made secretary of this Asiatic society and his very kind demeanour, his great interest, sparked a lot of interest from others who kept on sending him copies of all the inscriptions they found. But even then, he couldn't work it out. But then one day, one of his correspondents, a man called Alexander Cunningham, who later became the chief archaeological surveillance of the whole of India, British India, sent him this. This was again from Sanchi. And this was different to the normal inscriptions which he'd been getting. They were all short sentences, as you can see. And so he thought, well, they, must, they can't be the normal inscriptions which we've been looking at. They must be something else. And he thought, I, and they were also very rough, not like the normal Ashokan writing. So he thought either they must be obituary notices or they might be records of people who've given dana, given donations, and they just wanted their name up there somewhere. And what James Princep picked out was that they all had a similar ending. And you can see it circled here. Now I'll give you a close-up of that ending. There it is. Almost all of them ended the same way. And that was the clue. He'd been studying coins, and from that, he'd worked out the genitive. And he discovered that this funny little L shape on the left was the genitive ending Asa, like in Buddhasa. So he got one letter. And then he thought, well, if this is recording a votive offering of some kind, maybe the last word means gift. Danang, donung in Roman, in Latin donation in our language. And he figured, well, if it's Danang, that first squiggly letter, that squiggly S, will be the Da. The upside down T will be the Na. And the dot at the end will be the Ng. Very common ending, Buddhang, Saranang, Chami, and so forth. And when he'd worked that out, as he sweetly wrote, within a few minutes, I became possessed of the entire alphabet. So now he had it, and he was able to announce to the Asiatic Society, I've got the alphabet now, I can do it. And he also noticed that in the big inscriptions, the first 15 characters were always the same. So he thought now he started to analyze these first 15 characters. And there they were. And now, because he knew the characters, he could translate them into something he knew. And there it is. Devanama Pia Piyadasi Laja Hevan Aha. Now he knew Sanskrit. So he could start trying to interpret this. And 
I don't know whether any of you who know Pali can work this out, but the first word, Devanama Pia, that word Pia means beloved or dear, comes in the Satipatthana Sutta. Pia Rupang Sata Rupang, whatever is dear at any sense to all. So that's the Pia, and the Deva, of course, is a god or a goddess. So it means beloved of the gods. So here is someone beloved of the gods, and he reckoned the next word was a proper noun, it was the name, Piyadasi. Piyadasi, beloved of the gods. Larger. That stumped him for a while. And then he realized that actually it was just a different version of Raja, king. King Piyadasi, beloved of the gods, and the rest was easy. Hevang, like Evang, Evang Mesuta, thus. Aha, spoke. So each inscription starts. Beloved of the gods, Piyadasi, the king spoke thus. And then it goes into the inscription. So he was able to go along to the meeting and say, I can do this now. And he started with gusto, translating all the edicts they'd found. And the first one he tackled was Feroz Shah's golden pillar. And he went for that. Of course, this is not the whole edict. And his translation was initially a bit off. This is a much better later translation of it. And he was expecting, because of the sheer geographical distribution of all these, that this would be some great king boasting about his achievements, some grandiloquent statement about his power. And what he got was the opposite. Happiness in this world and the next is difficult to obtain without much love for Dhamma, self-examination, respect, fear of evil, and enthusiasm. But through my instruction, this regard for Dhamma and love of Dhamma has grown day by day and will continue to grow. So it's all about Dhamma. And notice also, no mention of Buddha. It's totally universal. But he still didn't know who was writing all this. Who was this Piyadasi? Because there was no mention in any of the ancient scripts, ancient histories, of a Piyadasi. They'd heard of people like Chandragupta and Bindusara and Ashoka and so forth, but no Piyadasi. And he thought, well, maybe this is Devana Piyatissa of Sri Lanka who was a king of that name. But then he thought, well, why is a king of Sri Lanka putting edicts or inscriptions in Afghanistan, at the bottom of the Himalayan mountains, all through India? It just didn't make sense. And for a long time, he was puzzled. And then another correspondent of his, a man named George Turner, a British man who was in Sri Lanka, had been studying the Sri Lankan, the Mahavamsa, the great chronicle of kings. And he wrote to Princep and said, look at this quote I've come across. It talks about Piyadasi, the grandson of Chandragupta, the son of Bindusara, viceroy of Ujjain. So then you had a positive identification. Piyadasi was actually Ashoka. And that name Piyadasi was just his regnal name, which he took when he became king, and which he regularly used. Later, much later, in 1915, they did actually find an edict, an inscription, where Ashoka had actually used his own name instead of Piyadasi. That was like the icing on the cake, but there was no, no doubt at all. So there they had it. They realized that this was King Ashoka who was writing all these things. Here's another one which Princep came across. And this is a king talking about his own Dhamma practice. I should mention that very soon after that 1837 triumphal discovery, Princep started getting blinding headaches. He got a tumor on the brain. He had to be repatriated, basically an invalid to England, and sadly died soon after. 
but his work continued. And so here we come to another translation. This is Ashoka talking about his own Dhamma practice. So here is a powerful king talking about how he's doing in his meditation. It is now more than two and a half years since I became a lay disciple. Until now, I haven't made much progress. But now that I've visited the Sangha for more than a year, I've made good progress. So he's pretty happy with his meditation. And again, I think there's a background to this, because initially Ashoka had a lot of Brahmins at his court, a hangover from Bindusara. And he decided probably to become a Buddhist in his terms at that time, really as a political move to get rid of the Brahmins in his court, but he wasn't very serious. But after the Kalinga battle and his remorse, he suddenly started getting very serious, practicing very seriously, and he was inspired also by a monk he met called Nigroda, who he questioned very carefully. Nigroda was an Arahant, and Nigroda actually was the son of Sushima, Ashoka's elder brother, whom he'd killed in the fight for the throne. So here he is taking instruction, advice from Nigroda, and then he takes a teacher, remember this name, Moggaliputta Tissa, an Arahant, and that was his teacher, who was effectively head of the monks at that time in India. And then he started making progress. And then look at this edict. This is what's called the Kalinga Edict. Beloved of the gods conquered the Kalingas eight years afterwards. 150,000 deported, 100,000 killed, many more died. After they'd been conquered, he came to feel a strong inclination towards Dhamma, a love for Dhamma and for instruction in Dhamma. And now he feels deep remorse for what he did. Even a thousandth part of the deaths that he caused now pains him deeply. So what a huge turnaround. I should say that this edict was never actually posted in Kalinga itself, maybe out of respect for the feelings of the Kalingans. It appears in various other places, but not in Kalinga. But this one does appear in Kalinga. All men are my children. What I desire for my own children, I desire their welfare and happiness in this world and the next, and I desire it for all men. So he's offering the Kalingans peace. He's saying, look, I've totally changed, which he had. And he goes on. Another rock edict. And now he's talking about the forest people. Now these were people, tribal people, within his vast realm, very unruly, very difficult, causing a lot of trouble. And he's saying he could have punished them. Of course, he could have sent his army against them, but he's entreating them and reasoning with them. Look, please act properly. In spite of my remorse, I have the power to punish you, but I don't want to do it. I really want that you be ashamed of your wrong. Don't be killed. I desire non-injury, restraint, impartiality to all beings. So that's his message to these unruly tribal people. And it seems they heard it, because we hear of very little trouble. And then there were Kalinga's neighbours, because again, this was put up in Kalinga. You might remember from the map that there was an area right down south, the very bottom of India, another white area, never conquered by Ashoka. He never attempted to conquer it. Once he'd conquered the Kalingas, had his remorse, he stopped, and here he is saying, well, you might think, what's my intention towards you? And he says, my only intention is that you live without fear of me, that you trust me, that I may give you happiness, not sorrow. And actually, we find him providing assistance to these southern areas. Maybe it's the first example of foreign aid that we know. So no invasion, just foreign aid. And he wishes to encourage them to practice Dhamma. 
so that they may attain happiness in this world and the next. He also had very friendly relations with the same kings or their successors who fought with Chandragupta a few decades earlier. This was King Antiochus in Bactria and Ptolemy in Egypt. Very friendly relations, exchanges of families, exchanges of ambassadors, exchanges of gifts. And then he talks about non-killing. He says, for many hundreds of years, people have been behaving badly. They've been killing beings, harming beings, improper behavior towards Brahmins and ascetics. But now the sound of the drum has been replaced by the sound of Dhamma. I should explain that in the old days, when someone was to be executed, their arms were bound tightly behind their backs. They were led out of town to the place of execution to the sound of a harsh drum. That's the drum. And now that's gone. And this compassion, this non-killing, also extended to animals. Now, there are very few examples in the history of the world where you get a country which extends the same protection to animals as it was extending to human beings. And here we have it. And he's against killing. He doesn't want his animals killed. And he goes vegetarian. And also his whole royal household goes vegetarian. And here he is. It's quite an interesting insight into what they ate. It says in the old days, hundreds of thousands of animals were killed daily to make curry. But now, only two peacocks and one deer are killed, and very soon even they won't be killed and will be totally vegetarian. So, if you were in Ashoka's household, if you were in his royal court, you were vegetarian. And he went on to announce a whole list of protected species, enormous numbers of them, a great long list, many types of birds, pigeons, ducks, geese, queen ants, bats, bulls, deer, long, long list, and it concludes with all four-footed animals that are neither useful nor edible. So he can't completely abolish killing in his empire. No doubt some people actually had to depend on meat to live, who knows, but he's doing his very best. And a special protection for mothers. He says you can't kill nanny goats, ewes, sows with young or giving milk, or if they have young less than six months old. So that protection is there. And even, he says, in the forests, don't burn husks, because there might be small little creatures in them. If you have to burn anything, burn pure wood, not that. And on certain days, no killing in any of the reserves. So he's, as far as possible, banning any kind of killing, certainly no killing for pleasure, no hunting. And I mentioned earlier that he probably started the first welfare state. Now here he is saying that whatever medical herbs suitable for humans or animals are not available, I've had them imported and grown. Of course, in those days, almost all the medicine was herbal and people would go out, they'd pick the herbs. Clever people, doctors and so forth would know what to use and would make the medicine. And now he's saying, I want these herbs, these medicinal herbs, available to anybody throughout my kingdom. Imagine the equivalent today of if you go into a chemist and every item is free. I don't think Big Pharma would like it, probably. But here was Ashoka giving totally free medicine to everybody. And along the roads, I've had banyan trees planted He's very concerned about his roads to make them pleasant, to walk down, to go down, so that they can give shade to animals and men. I've had mangrove groves planted, and at intervals of eight crosses. That was about a day's journey. I've had wells dug, rest houses built, and in various places I've had watering places made for the use of animals and men. So he's trying to make his roads comfortable. 
sounds a lot better than our roads today. And his devotion to duty. In the old days, of course, the kings would have their times when they were on duty. They'd give their orders, they'd receive people, and then they'd go off and have a good time, go hunting, do whatever they wanted to do. And he says, no, I'm on duty all the time. And he says, I've given this order that at any time people can be posted with instructions and you can disturb me wherever I am. And he gives examples. You can disturb me if I'm in the women's quarters, if I'm in my bedchamber, if I'm out in the park just enjoying myself, wherever I am, you can come and if there's urgent business to be done, I'll do it on the spot. So this massive devotion to duty. And he says, truly I consider the wealth, this welfare of all to be my duty and I have to exert myself and give the prompt dispatch of business. There is no better work than promoting the welfare of people. And this is the debt I owe to all beings to assure their happiness in this world and the next. So I think we can see why during his reign there was never any hint of any civil disturbance, insurrection, war, nothing. Total period of golden peace. And in the old days, of course, the kings would tour the country, but Ashoka is now having Dhamma tours. In the old days, they used to go out hunting and they'd probably arrive somewhere, eat everybody out of house and home and the caravan would move on. But now, he goes on, he goes on tours to Sambodhi. Uh, he visits and gives gifts to Brahmins and ascetics. He visits and gives gifts of gold to the aged. And he's actually instructing people in Dhamma himself. So that's quite remarkable. He's discussing Dhamma with them, instructing Dhamma. And he delights in doing this. And then religious tolerance. Of course, he was a very sincere practitioner of Dhamma himself, but he tolerated all religions and wanted them to grow. He says he doesn't value gifts and honours as much as he values this. There should be growth in the essentials of all religions. And he also says, don't praise your own religion out of excessive devotion because otherwise you condemn others with the thought of let me glorify my own religion, he only harms his own religion. And we actually find him donating caves to the Ajivakas. They were a completely different sect, rivals to the Buddhist, and here he is donating a cave towards them. So really he's encouraging total religious freedom, no barriers at all. And prisoners. He actually set up officers who would go round, of course there were some prisoners, to work for the proper treatment of prisoners and towards their unfettering. And if these officers think, well, this one has a family or this one is old or whatever, to work towards their release or this one has been bewitched I think nowadays we'd say they've got a mental problem. Uh, so he's really trying to release them all. And his Dhamma Mahamatas are occupied everywhere. And then he says, in the 26 years since my coronation, on 25 occasions, I've had a general amnesty for all prisoners. So his jail costs must have been rather low. Not too much overhead there. Now, he also took a very active interest in the Sangha. And it came right down to even telling the Sangha what books to read. He said, you should read this sutta, or that discourse of the Buddha. And he's actually giving them instructions about what he thinks they should read. 
but he became very concerned because there started to be divisions in the Sangha during his realm. And we suspect this was because of his huge support for the Sangha. He actually built an enormous number of viharas, of places. It said 82,000. Some of these might be just little places, but the support was there and he was feeding them. There was a huge monastery which he built himself uh, just near his capital of Pataliputra. And so some elements started creeping into the Sangha of that time who just wanted an easy life. You'd get fed, you didn't have to do much, Ashoka was supporting you, and you could just have a nice life. And these people started creating problems, and there started to be schisms. And he writes these edicts. And I wish that the Sangha community always be united. And then he gets tough. He says, any monk or nun who splits the Sangha is to be thrown out of the Sangha, to wear white clothes and to reside somewhere else. So he's very, very concerned at this pending split in the Sangha. And so he decides that he will have a great conference, a great Sassana Council. You probably remember the first Sassana Council they're held very soon after the Buddha's death. That's the one which Ananda famously attended only after he became an Arahant the night before. The second one was also held in India. And here we have the third. And he had it at Pataliputra, his capital. And this was to heal the schisms which had occurred in the Sangha. And he wanted it to be conducted by Moggaliputta Tissa, who was his teacher, and who was an Arahant. He wanted to correct any errors in the text and drive out any problematic monks. He was even interviewing monks himself. But he had a problem. Moggaliputta Tissa had got disgusted with these new monks who were coming in, being disrespectful, believing in the wrong things, and so forth and he decided to go off for a 10-year retreat in the Himalayas. Not available. So Ashoka sends a messenger. We're building this massive hall. You can see the foundations of it here. You can see how massive it is, which is where the, the conference will be held, and we need you to chair it. No reply. He sends more messengers, no reply. More messengers, no reply. Finally, he sends a boat up the Ganges with instructions to bring Mongoliputta to Sir anyway. So they get him, they bring him down, and he chairs the conference. And they go through all the texts, and a large number of renegade monks are thrown out, and the texts are corrected, and the good Dhamma is again restored. And then he thought, good, well, we've sorted India, what about other countries? Why not we spread Dhamma elsewhere? And then he started a major program of spreading Dhamma as far as he could see all over the known world. And these were what he called his Dhamma Dutas, his Dhamma Messengers. Now the first place they went to was Sri Lanka in the south. And it arose because the King of Sri Lanka, this one called Devanama Piyatissa, sent a envoy to Ashoka, and Ashoka replied, saying, well, this is all very nice, exchanging envoys and ambassadors, but you should take Dhamma. And the king agreed. And so Ashoka sent down his only son, Mahinda, to teach Dhamma, and Mahinda, remember, was an Arahant. So he goes down to Sri, Sri Lanka, teaches the king, teaches them there, and that is how Dhamma spread to Sri Lanka. And then the king got very enthusiastic down there, and he said, oh, can we have some relics? 
So maybe slightly reluctantly, Ashoka sends him some relics because he had plenty of them in India. And then the king said, and now can we please have a cutting of the Bodhi tree under which the Buddha got enlightened? And Ashoka was very reluctant to send that. He didn't want to damage or deface the Bodhi tree in any way at all. But this king of Sri Lanka was pressing him. So finally, very reluctantly, he said, all right, let's take a cutting. He sent it down with his daughter, Sangamitta, who of course was a nun and an arahant. And she took it down. Ashoka accompanied the cutting all the way to the Bay of Bengal until it went on the ship. Apparently he even waded out to sea to be with it as far as possible. And so Sangamitta took this cutting of the Bodhi tree to Sri Lanka where it was planted. And despite Ashoka's reluctance, as we shall see later, it was very lucky that he did send it there. So that was Sri Lanka, his son and his daughter. To the west, he had good relations, as you know, with Antiochus and Ptolemy. Antiochus was in Bactria, Ptolemy was in Egypt. These were Alexander's successor kings. But because of these friendly relations, his Damodutas, his monks, could freely pass. And they went to Kashmir, Afghanistan, Syria, Iran, Egypt, and even into Europe. So big spread of Dhamma there. And then to the north, Nepal, Bhutan, and maybe even China or Mongolia, we're not sure. And then finally to the east, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, and Suvarnabhumi, the land of gold. And that was Burma and Thailand. And when he sent those two monks, again Arahants, Sona and Uttara, to this Suvarnabhumi, his teacher, Mogaliputta Tissa, the Arahant, prophesied that this land of gold, as we know, could keep this jewel of Dhamma. And that's exactly what they did. And this was the start of that long tradition of teachers, initially monks, right down to Saiji Ubakin and Goengaji. And this is his, one of his inscriptions, his song of ecstasy, if you like, at this spreading of Dhamma. There is no gift like the gift of Dhamma. And you might remember the Buddha's quote, Sabbe Danang Dhamma Danang Jinati. The gift of Dhamma is the highest gift. And here Ashoka is reflecting exactly that quote. No acquaintance like the acquaintance of Dhamma. No distribution like the distribution of Dhamma. No kinship like the kinship of Dhamma. And then he defines it in totally universal terms. Not even any mention of Buddha. He talks about proper behavior, generosity, good shila, not killing living beings. Totally universal. And here's another edict where he's expressing his satisfaction. Of course, he was a conqueror before over Kalinga, a military conqueror. Now he's saying it is the conquest by Dhamma that beloved of the gods, that's Piyadasi, considers to be the best conquest. It gives great joy. But even this joy is of little consequence compared to the great fruit to be experienced in the next world. Now, up to now, he'd been putting out his edicts, his inscriptions on rocks, but now he ups his game. He starts putting them on pillars, like one of those pillars was the one which Firoz Shah had on his kotla, his 14 Delhi. And you can see the distribution of them. These pillars were massive, 50 tons, approximately 50 feet high. You can imagine the weight of them, and mostly they were near rivers, because they could be transported by a river up and down. Usually on sacred sites, Sarnath, where the first discourse was given, Lumbini, where the Buddha was born, Vishali, where he spent a lot of time, places like that. But also on important crossroads, near big cities, places which people would frequent. And there his message was being carried far and wide. This is the one at Versali, just to give you an indication. You can see how high they are. And this one has a lion on top. They all had different sculptures on top. For instance, at Lumbini, there was a horse, signifying how Buddha, from his birthplace, rode out 
to get enlightened. This is the one at Sarnath. You might recognize this. This is the symbol of modern India adopted by Nehru. It's the lion in four directions, signifying the Buddha giving his first discourse and spreading Dhamma in all the directions. And another thing to note is the sheer quality of the sculpture. It's really quite beautiful. It's polished, and before Ashoka, there was really nothing like this found in India. All the previous sculptures were really very crude by comparison. So it looks as if Ashoka attracted artists, maybe from Bactria, maybe even from Greece. They came, settled down, and worked on all these beautiful sculptures. Now we come to his final years, and these are sad years. 239, his queen dies. A San Dimitra, his loyal queen who had been with him for a long time, his mainstay, she passed away. And a few years later, not long after, he married another queen, a much younger woman, who turned out to be enormous trouble. She was actually anti-Dhamma, and she became very jealous of the time that Ashoka spent uh, practicing Dhamma, supporting Dhamma, to the point where she actually decided, out of spite, to poison the Bodhi tree. So she put a thorn in it, a poison thorn, as a result of which the Bodhi tree died. And this frees below, of course we have no images of Ashoka, it was far too long ago, but we do have one or two sculptures which are thought to be of Ashoka, and this one, the central figure, is thought to be Ashoka fainting into the arms of his female attendants at the site of the dead Bodhi tree. Later on, this queen, Tisharakshita, created so much trouble that she was executed. She led an anti dhamma faction at Ashoka's court, and they were all sent packing. There was a big coup, they were all sent away, and order was restored to the court. But by now, Ashoka was becoming really very old, very weak. His inclination to give dana was no less than it had ever been, but now it became almost unreasonable. He was emptying his treasury, giving dana to the monks. And his successor, Samprati, actually had to give an order to the treasury to ignore Ashoka's orders. Because the treasury would have been emptied, the kingdom would have been bankrupt. There was even a point where Ashoka donated his entire empire to the Sangha. And of course, Samprati and the, and the treasury officials had to go along to the monks and say, well, Actually, guys, it's not quite like that. We're buying back the, we're buying back the empire and here's some money. <laughs> so there he was. He was really not that strong anymore. And we hear of his last, uh, his last days. Samprati was now more or less in charge. Ashoka was too weak to do anything about it. And we hear of him on his deathbed. He can't eat much now. And he has one cherry plum in his hand. That's all he can eat. It's given to him. And he says, no, I won't eat this. I want to give even this to the Sangha. So it's taken away, it's mashed up, made into a soup, so that he can get the merit from as many monks as possible having that soup. And he dies. So that was Ashoka's reign. And here is one of his edicts talking about the future. Wherever there are stone pillars or slabs, this Dhamma edict is to be engraved that it may long endure. As long as my sons and great-grandsons live, and as long as the sun and moon may shine, so that people may practice it as instructed. For by practicing it, happiness will be attained in this world and the next. So that's his motivation for all this. And then finally, a quote from a British historian, H.G. Wells. 
He wrote The War of the Worlds, you might know that book. And this is his comment on Ashoka. In the history of the world, there have been thousands of kings and emperors who called themselves their highnesses, their majesties, their exalted majesties, and so on. They shone for a brief moment and quickly disappeared. But Ashoka shines and shines brightly, like a bright star, even unto this day. Thank you.